Hi, everybody. It's Al. Uh, today, my guest has been, uh, today, my guest uh, is Patrick Byrne. He's been dubbed the most interesting CEO in America. <laughs> He's yeah. led over, Overstock.com for almost 20 years, including their IPO. He's got an amazing background. He's got an undergrad from Dartmouth College, a master's from Cambridge University in Great Britain, a PhD in Stanford, where he's also taught. So please welcome Patrick Byrne uh, to the show. Hi, Patrick. Alex, such an honor to be on your show. Thank you so much. So I have to ask you, Patrick, um, I was really, I think you're just amazing. I think you have a beautiful mind. I, I just, I, I really do, man. I, you're just incredible to me. I have a question. In the 2000s, the late 2000s, you waged a war against naked short selling, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you were, you went full, you know, scorched earth on these guys. <laughs> it, it was kind of, it was a, I, th I think, well, I, I, I'm short, I'm not six months into it, I was told this will surely go down in the history of Wall Street. And then it on up going on four or five years. So yeah, you want me to tell you a little bit about that? I'd or? love to hear it. Yeah. So, you know, I got into it through naked short selling, but that's just the, to understand that, that to me was just the facet to understand the big issue. Here was the big issue. There's a settlement system under Wall Street. And when you start talking this stuff, I know people go to sleep, but it's really important to understand that when you buy and sell stock on Wall Street, you know, you buy 100 shares of IBM for me, uh, you think that I'm that there's some system that's taking 100 shares that, that I own and it's sliding it to you and it's taking money from your account and sliding it to mine. That's not really what's going on at all. What's going on is so much more co is complicated than that. Why don't I, hey, do, do you have a few minutes? Why don't we, I'll give you, I'll be a bit more expansive. And then if you want to edit this down and post, yeah, yeah. Down, I'll tell you the, I'll tell you, you guys the history and everything. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going, no, seriously, if this is too, if I drag no, on. No, we have all the time in the world. And if you want to reduce this, feel free. Absolutely. Okay. What happened was, it's kind of funny when I was a little kid, my seventh birthday, 1969, I went to New York for the first time and my dad took me to see Wall Street, the New York Stock Exchange. And I was fascinated. He wanted me to see the capitalism. I was fascinated that there were guys on bicycles riding around in downtown New York in the 1960s. And they had sacks of stuff. Uh, of, and anyway, that's what I remember is these guys with sacks over their shoulders. They were called jo stock jobbers. And what they did was they bicycled among the different brokers with... So you and I make a trade on one day and three days later, these guys are going between our brokers with stock certificates from my account and moving them to your account. That's actually how it worked. And it was very cumbersome. In the 1960s, volume on Wall Street quadrupled and the guys on the bicycles log jammed. It's just like a database. If you ever work with a database and there's a, there's a conflict and it locks and then that lock ripples out and... Well, that started happening and took down a couple of big brokers, actually. There was something called the Great, Paper, Great Wall Street Paperwork Crisis from about 1969 or to like 71, 72, where they actually, Wall Street was only open four days a week and it was open for limited hours each day. And that was to give the guys on the bicycles a chance to catch up. The, the SEC got the whole industry together in 1971, and they proposed two solutions. One solution was, which the uh, one so, which the brokerage industry liked, was that they would create some kind of peer-to-peer -peer settlement system. So that process mm -hmm. of changing money and ca uh, the cash and the stock is called settlement. A peer-to-peer -peer brokerage settlement system, electronic somehow. And the other option was something called immobilization with dematerialization. It had only been done once before in the 1870s in Vienna. And the idea was everyone will put all their stock in one big vault. There's just one vault and that, and then they issue basically what are IOUs for that stock. And then what's really trading around among the, the, the investors is really just these IOUs. Well, the industry wanted the first solution, but the SEC forced the second solution down on them. 
at, temporarily. It was just, they said the technology isn't ready to do the first solution. So they created something called the DTCC. They actually took a back office of the New York Stock Exchange and they, and they made it a company. And they said this own legally all, I, I love doing this. I, when I was fighting this fight in public speeches, I'd say, hey, raise your hand if you own any publicly traded stock. And of course, everyone's hand, almost everyone goes up. And I would tell them, no, everyone with their hand up is wrong. None of us actually own any stock. Believe it or not, all the stock in America, cor publicly traded corporate uh, stock is owned. I don't mean just warehouse, but actually owned by a company no one's ever heard of. It owns the stock. And then there are entitlements, contractual right. entitlements. And so you can think of it like a hub and spoke. And at the hub is the DTCC. And then there's there's a there's a certain number, a dozen or so clearing brokers who are directly wired into the DTCC. And then there's a another ring of a couple thousand wired into them. So when I'm buying, when I'm selling you stock and I'm at one broker and you're at another, what's really happening is there's this daisy chain of contractual rights. And all that's happening is different contractual rights are different, and these entitlements are moving around. This is a crazy tenuous system. You don't own what you think you do. Believe it or not, the legal ownership is vested in a corporation that, that no one's ever heard of actually owns corporate America. And I know this sounds batshit conspiracy theory. I believe but it. <laughs> you can look this all up. The legal ownership. And all you really, if you read your brokerage contract down at the bottom, upside down, backwards in Greek, it's letting you know this kind of stuff. And so why this is problematic is there's really nothing that keeps, there can be many more share entitlements than there are underlying shares. A broker may have a hundred shares of IBM and they've got four clients who think they own IBM and they're telling this guy, you got 75 and you got 50 and you got 90 and you got 30. And that all adds up to 200 and whatever it adds up to uh, and 220 or something. and but there's only a hundred there. So it's fractional reserve banking without a reserve requirement. And that exists up and down that daisy chain. And what that really is, is a derivative risk that people don't understand right. is there. Latent derivative risk. And the derivative is a contract for difference. Although it's worse because it's not, now this is another thing. And George Soros figured this out. I have to, it's kind of funny. The irony in all this is Soros figured out this property that was at the core of his trading strategy called reflexivity or reflex. Have you ever heard, do they use that? I've expression? heard this word being thrown around in circles. Yeah. Yeah. And the classic, if you go to Harvard business school, like our mutual friend and you take finance, you'll learn a certain paradigm of the world. And in that paradigm, what I'm saying doesn't make any sense. And that paradigm just, you know, there's an underlying instrument, say a stock and there are derivatives and the derivatives, move around in price that it, it's derived from the underlying price of that uh, that underlying instrument but there's nothing up here in the derivative that affects the underlying instrument just like if you're at a horse race and there's horses out on the field and you and i are up betting in the betting parlor nothing in our betting actually affects which horse is out there winning well that's the that's the point of view of the guys with phds in finance but just remember as buffett says a guy with a PhD in finance is just someone who spent four years in a room learning to talk to others in Greek letters. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I really don't know anything about the world. <laughs> and in the world, it is possible for those derivatives to actually affect the underlying stock. And that's what George Soros figured out. And that property is called reflexivity. So here's the problem. You have many more, you, one can have many more of these share entitlements than there are underlying shares. So it's fractional reserve banking with no reserve requirement and nobody knows. That can create situations where one can have short squeezes, which is uh, I think the subject of near and dear to people's heart, AMC. What happened in the last couple of years? There were two, GameStop was the yeah. other one. Right. And the theory always is, so, I'll, I'll, so I'll, the theory always, always is that if you end up with, you know, uh, 10 million shares of share ownership, but there's only two or three million underlying, two or three million underlying shares, 
if at some point everyone was forced to deliver, it would actually mean that the stock would be much higher. Another way of saying right, that right. is the stock would naturally be here, but because some people are able to use the system to, to generate excess supply, they can drive the stock down. So, so <clears throat> this, this, I became aware, so this is the backstory. In 05, some people started reaching out to me. I call them the pajama hadeen, the people, this, this mass movement started reaching out to me in actually 04 and explaining that there were some bad guys on Wall Street who had, who had learned to use loopholes in that system that were actually right. just created so there could be fault tolerance. So if something, if something, if somebody made a mistake, fat finger to trade, sold more shares than they had, you don't want the whole system to vapor a lot. So there was a little bit of fault tolerance, but a, but the theory became about 20 years ago that a number of hedge funds centered on a guy named Stephen Cohen in specific. Oh yeah, had had figured out what would really probably happen is in the late 90s during the dot-com boom, and there were a lot of trash companies that got, you know, suddenly they have a $10 billion valuation and nobody knows even what to do. And that was, that was uh, what the, the SEC decided, we can't police all these penny stock uh, and all these weird little companies. We're not going to police it. So we're going to sort of take our, we, the SEC, are going to turn a blind eye and to hedge funds who want to come in and do some manipulative activities, which just means using that, using the fault tolerance to end up selling much more stock, to shorting much more stock than there actually is to short. Right. And they did, uh, and they turned a blind eye. And that's a little bit like some sheriff in a community deciding, well, crime's so bad, I can't solve all of it. So I'm going to count on, I'm going to give a nudge and a wink to some vigilantes and say, hey, you folks can start taking care of, you know, the bank robbers or something. Well, what happens is over time, the vigilantes start working their way into, you know, eventually they're going after jaywalkers and eventually they're just, you know, that's, that's what happened. The SEC, I understand in the late 90s, just signaled a blind eye to misbehavior in the penny stock market. Mm -hmm. And then what happened in 01, 02, 03, 04, they started moving their way up the food chain. And in 04, they got to a $200 million company called Overstock.com, which I had started a few years earlier. So that's, that's how I got into this. And somebody, and it's kind of funny, now that process by which they generate more shorting than there is actual shares to short is called naked short selling. I've learned that people sort of vapor lock when I start hearing financial terms. So I tend to avoid it. And really the common denominator, that's really just one of the problems. There's others, there's something called abuse of the option market maker exemption, which used to be called the Madoff exemption because yes. Bernie, Bernie Madoff, when he was chairman of NASDAQ, got the SEC to build this exemption in for market. And it really just became another route by which hedge funds could, could do this manipulative trading, not for its intended purposes. So the, certainly the market, uh, so I'll stop there. And do you want to talk about that before I get talking about the political, the deep capture aspect? Well, <clears throat> let, let me say this. When I think of companies like yours that they started with, I'm saying to myself, there's an overall big picture here. And I say to myself, you know, think about Amazon.com, right? They're a data provider. They're an IT provider. They're not just, you know, buying and selling and stuff on their platform. I started thinking about Amazon and I said to myself, who would make the most amount of money? It's, it's companies like Amazon. They can go after companies like Overstock, uh, GameStop, which is, uh, uh, you know, merchandising essentially, and AMC, which is a movie theater company because they Amazon wants them to... Uh, you know, buy and, and sell off of Prime, you know, the videos and all that stuff. So I'm saying to myself, is there a collaboration going on between Amazon and companies that are like hedge funds and financial institutions that are naked short selling uh, and, and doing this sort of thing? That, that's always been the, the, the back of my mind. And the way you're, you're talking about it, it just makes sense to me that, you know, these companies that do this, they're working in cahoots and there's tons and tons of oversight that nobody gives a crap about. Like like SEC, FINRA, and I've seen so much of it. What well, they're dirty. They're dirty because they get they know that there's good jobs waiting for them 
if they go on the outside, if they go along with it. Funny you bring this up. No, in 15 years or more, 18 years of talking about this, no one's ever brought that up. So I will share with you something, Alex, that I've never shared publicly. Somewhere in that process, I was involved with a, uh, a guy who was doing, a, a professional security guy who was doing, actually happens to be, you ever see the movie uh, Munich? Yeah, yeah. The Eric Bana character is actually, a, not Eric Bana himself, but the character he's playing is a... Uh, is a kid. Friend. Yeah. Say again? That he's Mossad. Yeah. That guy happens to be a friend of mine. And <laughs> he doesn't look like Eric Bana anymore. He's a uh, short, bald Jewish guy. <laughs> so, don't, so, so ladies, no one asked me for an introduction. But he's a wonderful fellow. He's actually a wonderful fellow. He... Uh, uh, and he was telling, he, we met because he'd been working for, a, uh, he had another client and been working this for years. And when we first met, he told me, you know, in my experience, this happens just not out of the blue. There's some other company, you have yeah. some competitor who is actually working in cahoots with the, uh, the, the funds doing this. Well, it turns out this was all Goldman and Merrill were behind what uh -huh. was going on in our company. And Goldman was Amazon's banker. And I did hear from a number of journalists that Bezos and who's the guy, who was his big, John Doerr, yeah. had this real beef about me, had a real beef. Whenever journalists mentioned me, Bezos would call them and scream. Some journalist gave a presentation at a conference once where he mentioned me and Emily Bezos and John Doerr went and some Business Week journalists told him about it and they skewered him afterwards and such. So it was kind of funny because I had this whole different attitude when I got into the internet of like, we're all trying to build something terrific here. But anyway, um, the, it's kind of funny because in the middle of all the fight I was in, there were certain people involved as characters on message boards. And you could tell there were like, there a couple of them were leaders that they would come and set a tone. And then pardon me, all the, what I call the chogies would show up and almost like they took their orders from that, whatever that one person on the message board said as the tone, everyone else. One day, it was New Year's Eve in about 2006, somebody made a mistake and they forgot to mask where they were. And they were at the head, and it was the guy leading this whole group of riffraff, chogis who do nothing, but there's a couple of people who did nothing but one, uh, two people published 10,000 articles about me. That's kind of an odd hobby for someone to <laughs> yeah. But by the way, one of them made a mistake once in a Wikipedia edit, and it turned out he was inside the DTC Corporation. The corporation that I was accusing of being in the middle of everything, that, <laughs> that journalist, his name's Gary Weiss, he made a slip once, it was all documented, and, it, and he slipped on, on in editing something that revealed his IP, and he was inside... A corporation which itself is like getting into Fort Knox. I've been yeah. there. You don't just wander in. So that was weird. Uh, but anyway, somebody made a mistake and it turned, it was New Year's Eve or Christmas Eve at like midnight. And they were, they were on these message boards leading the riffraff. And it was someone from the headquarters of Amazon. And what was also funny about that, assuming they were not in Amazon at that moment, what that meant was they were on a VPN. Yeah. Uh, and if they were on a VPN back then in 05, 06, typically it was just sort of executives of any company who got VPNs when back in 05, 06, it was not so widely spread. That was sort of normal corporate practice. So you add all that up, it means that on New Year's Eve at 11 p.m. or something in Seattle, there was some corp, uh, Amazon executive who was high enough to, to warn a VPN who was on obsessing and sort of le uh, leading this attack on Overstock and they were part of it and sort of directing it among the, the Chogis. So that's all been interesting to me. I never really, I never actually, I don't think I've ever explained that publicly, but yeah, I've always suspected Amazon. It's always uh, Amazon, it's Bezos. He, he, comes he comes across as this harmless old codger, but he's not, he's quite, I, I think there's a side of him that he doesn't show very publicly. I think he's a bit sinister and I think, uh, nefarious is a good way to call, call, call him I, that's what i would say um i will well, say this go ahead go ahead I'll, I'll tell you stories in our industry this is he was 
you know, he got in early and he had all, he had Goldman behind him the entire time. Yeah. So I always felt I wasn't really competing with Amazon. I was competing with Goldman and Goldman was able to just always manipulate our stock. Mm. Uh, you know, we ended up winning $34 million from a bunch of different players on Wall Street. Goldman was not one of them, but from different people involved for all this. But the data all showed, by the way, so you want to go back to the, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one thing on, on Bezos. Bezos was, Look, anyway, we'll we'll do that some another he, day. Yeah, and I, I, he he was famous for going around saying we'll buy you to companies, sending in a team to do due diligence and just ripping off their technology. That was the reputation. I heard it around the industry. It's just how they. It was kind of funny. You wouldn't like. I guess I seem. I maybe I viewed it too much as a game, and it's a game, and we're all here trying to build a new world together. Yeah, and. Yeah. It's just like I wouldn't go out in a game of golf. Well, I don't play golf, but I wouldn't go out in a game of anything and cheat because what's the point of playing the game if you're right, right? Uh, it just seemed, but he was well known in the industry for doing that. He did that to a couple of companies, one were dear friends of mine, and they caught him. They caught him and, and discovered that the due diligence team of accountants was actually five technologists and one accountant. Anyway, so that's really what his, so this is, it does, would not surprise me because that sounds like the kind of guy he, he apparently is, but uh, by all accounts, but let's get, let's, let's. Yeah, so let's let, me tell you, go ahead. let me tell you what's going on with, with AMC and, and GME right now. So you remember when um, these clowns got up in front of Congress and said, uh, we're very sorry what happened, and, and this is a mistake because of liquidity and, you know, the DTCC's requirements, and, and Robin Hood said X, Y, Z, and they brought in the CEO of uh, Citadel Securities, Ken Griffin, who is, in, in, in my personal opinion, an absolutely horrible human being, uh, but I'm not going to go after him ad hominem. And, he's an know, arm of the Fed. He's an arm of the Fed. He's yeah, an arm of the Fed, frankly. To essentially. Um, he said that they covered their shorts. Right. Turns out that was a lie yeah. because for the last 11 months, this uh, AMC especially has been shorted probably close to, I want to say, 20 billion shares. This is only a 500 million dollar, uh, 500 million share capitalization, you know, the market cap. And now uh, it's like have... it's, it's been over 11 months uh, going on almost a year now. And what we're realizing is that they're still doing the same tactic. They're using dark pools, uh, ATS systems to, to mask everything. I found out that their ATS system isn't even in the United States. It's in another country. And it gives them some kind of, uh, you know, a, a critical immunity if you, to some degree. In the, immune, in the uh, Caribbean by any chance? No, Singapore. Singapore, very, very loose laws over there. Hmm. Hong Kong controls it. Singapore executes. The effect is felt in the United States and on the market in the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and of course, payment for water flow. That's all part of the, the whole thing of 3ATS. Um, and we're sitting on a ticking time bomb. AMC, in my opinion, when I did the estimation of how many, how many shares uh, have been shorted and what they have to pay back, I don't think, D I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, DTC has the insurance policy, that $64 billion uh, insurance policy, right? Um, 64 trillion. Yeah. Uh, what, what happened is when this thing pops and it rips from the short squeeze, that's going to happen. There is no way Citadel or any of the 52, um, short hedge funds are going to live through this. There is no way. That's the theory, but let me give you something. I fought this fight for 15 years and the, the theory is I was surprised at what happened with AMC. Because the theory is that at some point there's that people have to settle their trades. With Overstock, something funny happened. So the SEC in 05 passed, due to the enormous public pressure, passed a very flimsy regulation against this stuff. It's called Reg Show, S H O. And it was as flimsy as they could make it. In fact, it drew widespread criticism and suspicion that what they had done was in order to allow this continue, come up with the flimsiest possible rule against it. So, which is kind of a way of letting something continue so you can't ever really stop it. Anyway, and that's Reg Show. They suspended enforcement of Reg Show twice uh, for, 
they have the authority. So it's a terribly flimsy rule anyway, but they have the authority to say of a company, we're not even going to protect this company's trading in this company with that flimsy rule. They did it to overstock.com in the summer of 2019. So that e they were that they created a carve out where the rules on settlement, even the flimsiest guardrail, was let down for the trading in Overstock. And the only other time they've done that was they did it to Overstock in like 2009 or 2010. They also suspended enforcement of the rules. So it's just crazy. My point is that we dreamed for years. We knew that there was a there were two or three times many shares of stock held out there as there were underlying shares. And when you looked at the float, the float was actually so tiny. Yeah. It was set up to be the biggest short, it would have been the biggest short squeeze in history. They didn't, uh, and they just never. So we kept just going to the SEC and saying, look, if you just apply the law, we're not asking for anything special, just apply the rules. And they did this, they did this. They And that's because, well, it turned out that because of this, uh, uh, that this is allowed at the at the heart of our lawsuit. What we discovered is it's responsible. It, re, it was responsible for two thirds of the revenue of Goldman Sachs. Two thirds of their revenue came from the stock loan desk, which really amounts to turning a blind eye to yeah. this kind of mischief. Uh, so it's enormously profitable for Goldman and the major banks. This the stock loan business, and the SEC never enforced it. And actually, I what's kind of funny, I came up. In a blockchain universe, none of this could happen in a blockchain capital market. So I invented this blockchain capital market called T0. It's the first blockchain capital market. And we started moving our uh, issuing stock there and, and moved to the SEC came after for the, us. In other words, no matter they are on the side, it's like some southern town where the sheriff's on the side of the drug dealers mm -hmm. and on giving them protection. And the drug dealers are in your neighborhood and you keep calling the sheriff for help. He won't help. And then if you go and try to do anything, like you try to put, you know, a fence around your house or something, the sheriff comes and knocks it down because he's really working for the drug dealers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so corrupt. So that really got me into this whole subject of corruption in the federal government. And that's when I became aware and started forming my theories about that. So with this Citadel uh and then the market makers, because uh, we're, we're the AMC crowd, including myself, are fighting two people. There's Citadel, the wow. securities company, and Citadel, the market maker. And there is a, it's it's coming to that point where there's no way out for them this time because that rule, that that show rule, I don't think it's even in the books. Is it in the books anymore? Yeah, it's in the books. It's what it, it governs. It's what's governing everything that rig show. Yeah. So what we're seeing is is a behavior by the DTC. Uh, especially when it comes to um, capital requirements and, and, and margin requirements, right? Uh, that's going up every couple of months now. And the, I, I see a market correction or a market crash happening in the next maybe 120 days, some kind, of, some kind of catastrophic event. And if that happens, the majority of the collateral that they have is going to be almost completely worthless, especially because they're taking out loans to, they don't use their own capital, mind you. They don't use their own money. It's somebody else's money. Um, and that's when I realized when this thing happens, the correction that's going to happen this year, uh, Citadel is, is posing itself with systemic risk. And I mean, real risk, because it's going to, they're not going to be able, they're going to default. They're not going to be able to pay their bills. They're going to have to defer to the DTC. DTC is going to have to start buying shares that are available for purchase. And this thing's going to pop. I knew AMC was a winner, a complete winner when the California teachers union bought in. They're the second largest union in the nation. Yeah. And the fact that they bought, you know, a, 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 a crap ton of shares, I was like, okay, this is actually going to happen. I'm not the only one that sees this, you know. The, the thing I will comment on that is you can understand all the laws of economics correctly and be absolutely right. But after 17 years, but you know what it's like? I used to, I have a friend, Arab guy, I played chess with. And uh, I used it. And whenever I started to beat him, I noticed he would like knock a napkin onto the floor and then go to lean and pick it up. And as he did, knock the chessboard over. <laughs> That's when, just when you think they have you have these people beat, they change the rules. They change the uh, they change the rules. They knock it over. In our case, 
it, you know, it got funny. I invented a blockchain capital market. It's T0. It's out there on Wall Street. It's growing like crazy. And this blockchain capital market, uh, <laughs> it, uh, this blockchain capital market, when we introduced that and we started to move our stock over into it, the SEC, well, the SEC, since I got public in some other issues last December 15th, the DOJ and the SEC launched an investigation on me for how I left Overstock two years ago, notwithstanding mm -hmm. the fact that the United that that the United States government had maybe more of a role in the facts that created that necessity than they're willing to have yet acknowledged. So they want to get me in trouble for leaving Overstock. And they're going and saying that the system I created, the thing about blockchain is there's none of this loosey goosiness. There is just like a token. You know, when, when I sell you a Bitcoin, you're getting my Bitcoin and I'm, you know, and that's, it's my Bitcoin moves to your wallet. Well, we could build a stock market just like that. And the, the coins would represent shares of stock. So you could use the technology of blockchain of crypto and apply it and build a version of Wall Street that no one could cheat. I thought this was great. I thought the SEC would love this. I thought a bunch of people loved it, but you know, the, the crooked sheriffs don't want that to happen. All, all the crooks don't want that to happen. And so it meant enormous resistance. And now I'm still, I don't know if I'm still under investigation or not. I don't pay any attention. I, I, I mean, I've gotten so many investigations against me over the last 15 years <laughs> since I started fighting the system. Uh, I don't even know if I'm under investigation anymore or not, but they were looking at me saying that creating this blockchain market and moving overstock into it was a, an attempt to manipulate the market, which is funny beca because what the blockchain does is it takes out all that slop, all that naked short selling. Why that's so funny is for decades, the SEC has been saying, oh, naked short selling doesn't affect the price of the underlying stock. Short selling doesn't, no short selling does. It's just like making a bet in a horse race. It doesn't affect the horse. The short selling, all this stuff doesn't affect the underlying stock. So, okay, I invented a system, myself and some colleagues, a blockchain version of the capital market where none of this craziness can happen anyway. And they say, that's manipulative. I mean, it's so upside down. It's, mm -hmm. uh, no, they, they say that, if, well, if you eliminate this, if you make it impossible for people to do that, that will manipulate the stock up. To which I say, wait a second, you're the guys who've been saying for decades that this stuff doesn't affect the price. So why is it that if we move it, that's going to affect the price? You can't have it both ways, SEC. <laughs> you can't have it both ways, DOJ. I got all the SEC statements saying how none of this stuff actually affects the underlying price. So just because I created a system that makes this crazy stuff impossible, how can you tell me that manipulates the price? You're the guys who say this thing doesn't affect that. I just listened to you, SEC. I got it right in there in the, off their website. All the explanations about how this short selling stuff doesn't affect the, or naked short selling does not affect the underlying price. So I created a blockchain system where it couldn't occur. And they say, well, you're trying to manipulate the price. Well, <laughs> Do you get why? why <laughs> it's hilarious. These guys, they talk out of both sides of the mouth. And that's because they're all crooks. They're all fucking crooks yeah, that are yeah. trying to get hired at the law firms. It's called. So now we get to the subject of regulatory capture. Can we get to some good yeah, stuff? Let's get to it. OK. Re there's a theory. A friend of M Milton Friedman came up with 50 years ago. A theory of regulatory capture. Stigler, Chicago. He said that society sets up regulators to protect us from certain industries. But what really happens is those regulators get bought off by the industries and kind of turned against us. The SEC is a paradigmatic example. It got it was set up to protect us from Wall Street. It's a bunch of Wall Street wannabes who want to who want to get. No, I shouldn't. I mean, actually, I know some people there that I like, but uh, I shouldn't criticize government officials like that. I'm sorry, but in general, it is, you know, people understand that if you go and work there and you're a good boy and you regulate nicely, when you're finished, there's a million dollar job waiting for you up the street at a law firm representing Goldman Sachs to represent them in the same cases that you were just on the other side of. So everybody learns the lesson very early and they're good boys. They'll go after retail people, they'll go after schmucks, but they don't go after the big guys because the big guys are their future employees. 
And that's regulatory capture. And that's happened at the SEC. And as a beautiful example of it, I mean, taking it to the, and, and actually there's a Marxist theory, which I <laughs> subscribed to. He came out of Harvard uh, Le uh, Law School called John Hansen, and it's called uh, Critical Legal Studies. You know that movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, out of that has grown this theory of deep capture that is not just the regulators, it's the senators, it's the congressmen, it's the fraudulent, the newspaper, they're all cat, the newspaper, everything is captured, everything's captured. And I'd have to go along with that. And if you want to know the, I'll pull this to a, a you, you remember two years, something I did not reveal two years ago when I punched out of Overstock, I punched out in order to go public about my involvement in some certain matters that we don't have to muddy this conversation up with. But I, pu I punched out and explained to people uh, that I had had a connection to Peter Strzok. What I did not explain at the time was when Overstock, Overstock six months before I punched out came under investigation again, the person at the SEC who opened the investigation was a woman named Melissa Hodgman. Melissa Hodgman is Peter Strzok's wife. So I, I got crosswise with Peter Strzok at the FBI and his wife at the SEC opens an investigation on me, which re was really intended to keep a knife at my throat to keep me silent, which is one of the reasons I had reached the point I had to say, screw this, I got to go public. And I went public about some things about Peter That's Strzok. incredible. Yeah. Peter Strzok, you can look this up. You look this up, Melissa Hodgman. Anyone can look this up. Oh, here's another thing about Melissa who has, I, believe, I think they still have an open investigation towards me. I can't wait, can't wait. I can't wait to get in front of some government officials with a tape running. I just can't wait. I can't wait for that one. Uh, but, you know, they had six investigations against me. Once I got crosswise with Wall Street and started talking about this stuff, they had six investigations against me from the SEC. Three went nowhere and they had to issue letters of like apology, basically. We found nothing. And three, they came up with the most trivial little things they could find that's ever been the SEC's ever found. So, but they, uh, they, they're coming after me. And the woman who started this is Peter Strzok's wife. And it's, it was really done because of this mishmash between me and Peter Strzok. That's incredible. You I don't even know what to say right now. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, this is the other thing I wanted to have about Melissa Hodgman. She became an assistant director at the SEC hours after the SEC had when when uh, Hillary Clinton's emails yes I remember this got out the SEC had some corner of that that they needed to investigate because maybe there's some publicly traded company information or something in there and the SEC investigated they promoted this woman to assistant or associate director of enforcement or whatever the title was so she had the rank to manage that investigation into Hillary in other words, Peter Strzok's wife managed the SEC investigation into Hillary's email. And what do you know? Didn't find anything. How odd. <laughs> is this, does this is a corrupt sounding to you? Is it? I mean, it's just insane. <laughs> then she opens an investigation on me to keep me silent so I won't dish dirt Critical. on some mischief Peter's been up to, which I can't. We won't even, yeah, we won't bring that up. Um, I will say this much. I, when, I, when I see the new head of the SEC, Gensler, he started about a year ago. Um, he has select mutism. He doesn't. He doesn't do any work. He 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 says he's for the retail investor, and he's made some regulatory changes in, ter in terms of PYF uh, payment for order flow and all those things. But now, what that did he do on payment for order flow? Um, they, they, were, they they had a uh, huge uh, discussion about is it should it be legalized? Should it be? Oh, I'm sorry, should it be uh, outlawed and banned? Um, and guys like. Uh, <laughs> This is such a, he's so full of shit. Guys like uh, uh, Ken Griffin says, oh yeah, if you want to get rid of it, go right ahead. I mean, I don't need it. It's an expense for me. Knowing that 70% of his capital that he makes, his revenue comes from this, comes from uh, front running people and their, and their shares. And it's like, it's like, you're, are you doing anything, Gary? Are you asleep? So what, what's been happening is they've been putting up these uh these these posters all around the SEC's headquarters in DC, and it says missing. It's a missing picture, uh, and it's got Gensler's face on there. It's like, have oh. you seen me? I have not. And it says I haven't been to work in years, and <laughs> just just making up you know stories and stuff, and just making it funny because it's just it's so silly. What? Where are you, Gary Gensler? Why aren't well, you doing Gary, anything? Gensler doesn't know it, but he's actually a friend of a friend, and. Uh, 
uh, someone he went to hire, actually. And I've actually heard okay things. That I hear he's smart, and I hear he's not corrupt, is what I've heard about Gensler. You think he's a straight uh, lace? Uh, well, that's what I've been told. That is that is not that, but he may be, I mean, maybe over his head. It may be too big a problem, maybe, but it's not that he's corrupt. And I he's have a this Goldman guy. Like Say again? He's a he's Goldman gonna, guy. Uh, well, then I'm not sure I'd buy he's not corrupt. They, they do understand that all the slop in the trading is what really generates the profit. And they hate blockchain because it takes the slop out. Although I understood Gary Gensler is open to blockchain. Everyone's afraid of it because they know it's going to totally shift the yeah. profitability of Wall Street. What it really will do is suck out of Wall Street the profitability of, you know, having informational edge like and being able to front run. So he comes from MIT. They, they pulled him out of MIT. That's what I thought. Talking. He was an yeah. academic. But he was Goldman before MIT? Yeah, he made, a, he made it with his brother over there. The, the two brothers, the two Gensler boys made it. Um, but what was, was his wife of died of cancer and then he became he was at mit when that happened oh. and then you know, he started teaching a course on blockchain that's where it started for him and then he started going into the derivatives market after that in fact some of his coursework is on youtube when you type in gary gensler mit his entire uh, course is actually listed and you can watch it for free very interesting stuff um I just I had a student in that class is the friend of mine. There was a student in the class who was a friend of mine. Oh, I see. Um, one, one of the things that I just don't understand is they tweet them, they call the SEC, they send emails, letters, notes, you know, smoke signals, yet he does not act against any of these short sellers and, and, and their manipulation or their tactics or anything. And, you know, there is this, there is this thing. It's like, what do you do at this point? What do you do? You know? You know, there's another expression in economics that I, I, it's one of these things that once you understand it, it explains everything. You see it everywhere. <laughs> and it's called this uh, theory of dispersed cost and concentrated benefits. And can I take a moment to explain, to describe Please. this? If talking about government action, so political economy, public choice theories, the area of economics, take something like sugar. The average American, I'm, my numbers are 15, 20 years out of date, but we were spending, let's say the price of sugar around the world is 20 cents a pound. But in the United States, we have a tariff on imported sugar and it raises it to 40 cents. So the average American spends an extra 20 cents per pound on sugar. You eat about 75 pounds of sugar a year, the average, right. what, the average American, when you think of all the bread and everything that sugar's in everything. Uh, even if you're not spooning it into your coffee. So 75 pounds, 20 cents, yeah, it's 15 bucks. So the average American is spending $15 more out of his budget for the sugar and everything that's in his, than he should in a year. That 300 million Americans, that's four or $5 billion, let's say. So American consumers are four or $5 billion worse off for that rule that there's a tariff on imported sugar. But that creates... Uh, several billion dollars of extra profitability mm -hmm. for about a dozen sugar companies in America. Yeah. And there's really about three who get the two thirds of the benefit. And they go to Washington. And when I looked at this 15 years ago, they were sprinkling around about $15 million a year around the halls of Washington. And by sprinkling $15 million around, they get their tariffs protected and they continue to make their extra two billion a year. So it's a system, you might think of it, that political mechanisms tend to ratchet this way. When there's, a, when there's a policy that creates a small cost on many, many, many people and a concentrated benefit, and, and that small cost, you're not going to go to Congress and lobby to save yourself that 15 bucks a year to get them to get rid of their tariff. But it is worth the time of those dozen sugar companies to go to Congress and spend 15 million bucks a year splashing around to keep the tariff in place. So political decisions tend to ratchet and create situations of dispersed cost and concentrated benefit. And I would say that what you're describing, well, the whole SEC regime and regime about stock settlement is another example of that. This fuzziness 
creates a cost on the market and it comes in small amounts out of all the retail investors in the marketplace and all the investors in them, it creates a tiny, it, it creates a very narrow but enormous benefit, this, mm. this, this regulatory regime that they're having the rules the way they are, create, or not enforcing the rules, as you point out, creates an enormous benefit for a small number of guys like Stephen Cohen, Ken Griffith, and, and the little ecosystems around them. So the system lurches from neutral enforcement of the rules to let's not enforce the rules. Let's create this enormous benefit for these, for the Goldman's and the Ken Griffiths of the world. And, and it creates a small cost that is distributed. Well, it creates costs that are distributed to all the investors in the world, all the other investors who aren't inside the game. And that's how, that's the explanation of why the SEC really lets persist this, th th this situation. And, and I, I have one more thing I want to say about that, which is concerning China. Can uh, you give me a, a yeah. minute? On, yeah. On this? I should probably write this up in a blog. So you and I think like, why is it that the rule just can't be, look, if you sell a hundred shares of stock, you got to deliver hundred shares of stock. That's it. Well, the rule is that you sell 100 shares, you got to deliver the 100 shares unless it's uh, unless the sun's rising in the east and this, that, and the other thing. There's all these carve outs and exceptions. And so guys like Goldman and Ken Griffith get away with failures to deliver that persist for months or years and they roll them over like kiting a check. So anyway, somewhere around 2010, the Chinese government got in contact and said, we'd like to send an economist to speak with you. Would you meet in the embassy? I said, sure. I went to the embassy. I you know, wouldn't say anything that would, I, only, I decided I would just stick to everything I'd describe publicly. So, but I would walk them through what they described publicly, of what I described publicly. So they sent an economist over from China, a lovely woman, a PhD, very attractive. My, my guess is they, uh, uh, anyway, very attractive PhD in economics. And we had this talk and I walked her through all the kinds of stuff but uh, that we're talking about, but in detail and on my writings. Yeah. I didn't give her anything like inside information. I just, all the stuff that I've been writing about, talking about publicly. About, about 10 years later, let's say that happened in 09. 10 years later, 2019, I'm over in China. And they said, and they made a big fuss when I went to China. I happened to speak Chinese and I was a student there back when they first opened up. And I, uh, they, they said, who would you like to meet with in China? And I said, well, I really love to talk to the people in your, oh, because that, that economist from China came over and when she questioned me, she told me we're building the rules to cover this in China and how to handle this. So I told her exactly what I told the SEC, what you should be doing, this is how the rules should work and it should force people to have to settle and boom, boom, boom. Just like you would think it works. Just like when you buy a baseball card from me, I got to give you the baseball card. There's not just, I yeah. can't just keep spinning rules around your head. I got to actually deliver what I sell. And so 10 years later, I'm in China and I'm meeting with these, uh, and they had, they, they said, here's something interesting. They, the DTCC of China or the people who oversee settlement they said they're not allowed to meet with foreigners. They consider this like people who designed the nuclear weapons. They understood. So here, our settlement system, we treat like it's some backwater, back office, who gives a shit? The Chinese understood this is like the nuclear launch codes, having, yeah. a, having rigor, having good settlement. And they made special arrangements for these people to come visit me. It was really quite an honor. And they flew down, they flew them down from, or they, from Beijing to Shanghai. I'm sure there were a couple spies in the room or something. Sure. There were eight of them uh, minding them, but, and we all sat and talked. And it was, it turns out we didn't need a three hour talk because I just wanted to ask them, well, how do you handle, how do you handle failures in the Chinese market? Because really what I had been explaining to this economist 10 years earlier was that we don't handle failures in our market. We sort of let them persist. When guys like Ken Griffith do it and Goldman Sachs, they have all kinds of ways. But how do you guys handle that? And their answer was quite simple. It's funny. The answer was, Dr. Byrne, there are no failures in the Chinese stock market. <laughs> and I said, yeah, well, I know. But I mean, I mean, yeah, I know that you don't want them. It's either against rules. But how do you handle it when it happens? Because And they're like, no, no, you don't understand. There are no failures in the Chinese market. 
And I still didn't get it. And I thought they were being like, just putting a good face on it. And I said, yeah, but what do you do when you have a hedge fund who does this and that, and they use this trading system and this strategy? How do you guys handle it? And the guy sort of put down his coffee. He said, Dr. Byrne, there are no failures in the Chinese stock market. And I got what he was saying, that if somebody acted like Steve Cohen or Ken Griffith over there, they get a bull in the back of their head because right. the Chinese correctly understand what the people are doing is poisonous yeah. to our stock, to their, to our, is ruining their stock market to have big players out there selling stock that doesn't exist and giving IOUs for it. It's screwing up all the price discovery mechanisms, obviously, but because they're not bought off, like our regulators are bought off, they took exactly what I've been saying the SEC should do. That's exactly what they do in China. It's, <laughs> it's, isn't that funny? No, There's so, so much funny. better capitalists than we are. What would you expect? They're so that when they take up capitalism, they do it better than we are. Our our system, you know, that underlies capitalism, the capital market, the most important mechanism to get right in like, uh, you know, one of the most important, it's like the heart and lungs of our yeah. system. We've allowed it to be bent out of shape and polluted with all these failures to deliver to benefit because it creates a narrow benefit, a narrow but enormous benefit for a bunch of rich guys. And it creates a huge cost for everybody else. So it's just funny that the Chinese listened to me and did exactly what I was saying. It turns out that they'd like drag someone off and shoot them if they play the kinds of games that get done well, here. You can't, you can't it's funny them. because Citadel is banned in China. They are not allowed to do business in China. And oh, oh <laughs> I, I know, know that, but it's case in point. That's hilarious. Yeah. That's exactly right. As soon as, you said, in the US too. as soon as you said China, I was like, should I mention that Citadel has been banned from doing business there because of naked short selling? They got caught. They got caught quickly and they were invited to leave China very quickly. Oh my gosh. I did not know that. That's it's so funny. That's, that's their core strategy. Stephen Cohen. Well, it's that plus information. There's manipulation of information because they own yeah. some journalists and then they trade in front of the information. So it's something like insider trading, except not because the information can just be lies because they're just yeah. manufacturing it in the hedge fund, but they still get the benefit of knowing next week's news before it gets printed so they can trade in front of it. Exactly. And he's working out of uh, Hong Kong these days and Singapore, like I said, and um, as Hong Kong, as you know, uh, there's all kinds of stuff going on over there uh, in terms of the Chinese government cracking down on things. It's just a matter of time before those guys get their... Uh, just desserts from China when they, I mean, eventually they're, they're going to, they're going to do something militarily, I believe. And uh, everything's going to be clamped down in Hong Kong and they're going to lose identity. I hope to God they don't. How, but, hasn't that already happened? No, I'm talking about real, like into their culture. Because when, you know, China's one of these things where it's like, when you, when the Chinese get somewhere, they saturate the culture, right? People from Hong Kong are very different. Hmm. They're different people. Their culture is different. All of it's different. So when China comes there and it starts to, you know, impose their perspectives, if you will, social perspectives, uh, and impose them onto the Hong Kong folks, I think you're going to see a loss of culture. Look, a good example was like um, Czechoslovakia with the with the Russians. You know, their entire culture was stripped away and replaced with soviet propaganda when you look at you know what is czech food what is czech drink what does it all mean we don't know for 40 50 years uh the soviets ran the show and they had books and diagrams on on how to what what a what a communist person eats drinks and all this stuff it's insane to me and um well, yeah but they did that to themselves they their oh, cultural yeah. revolution which is the, it's such a shame to me, because I admire the Chinese civilization and the Chinese culture is, you know, uh, the, one of the four great ancient civilizations on the planet. And, I agree. And, you know, maybe it's, it has so much to admire. And yet they came in, you know, the, uh, well, with Wen Hua, Dagger Min Yu the great, in the time of the, it's a beautiful expression in Chinese, Wen Hua, Dagger Min Yu in the time of the great cultural revolution. The goal was to eliminate all these distinctive Chinese That's things. horrible. And as, yeah. So, oh, well. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we've been speaking for about 45 minutes. You know, um, 
what I'm asking myself now is, excuse me, <coughs> you know, should should AMC and GME release like some kind of an NFT or some kind of um, profit sharing? Because then it would force the short sellers to come up and match up uh, and pay their pay their derivatives. I'm sorry, pay their uh, their shares off that way. What do you think of that idea? Well, I uh, what's funny. Well, one thing is just so you know. I'm a co-inventor of the technology underneath a lot of the NFTs is Ravencoin. I'm a co-inventor of Ravencoin. In addition, which is how they would do that. In addition, if they really want a simple way to do that, they should just go to T0, which is a- So Marco nice Hodes was talking about this and then they gave him rations of shit about it. Tell me what's going on with T0. Is it a great company like he says it it's is? a great company. It's growing like gangbusters. It's going to make a fortune over time. Well, once the SEC gets out of the way, but it's actually growing like hell. And I don't have any stake. I had to walk away and sell everything. They were going to destroy everything if I stayed there. Peter Strzok and his wife and yeah. others. And so I, and I regret, and of all, I, I think that T-Zero has an immense future, but uh, I can't be associated with any of these firms. Sure. Any, any, but they, uh, they, uh, they've, what, t, what game stock or AMC could do is issue a class of stock, uh, a new class of stock on T-Zero within blockchain. And once it's trading, then all they have to do is give dividends of that stock to all the shareholders of their NICE or NASDAQ stock. And once you do that, you're creating a, a non-fungible dividend. Yeah. Now, that is what the SEC and the DOJ is saying, burn you inventing that and trying to do it on overstock. That was manipulative. because. <laughs> Yeah. Which is what's so funny because you know it's like this for 17 years they told me the SEC said ah stop worrying about this short selling naked short selling remember at the end of the day all these people at the end of the day it all comes out in the wash at the end of the day the everything has to be delivered and the price reflects what the price is well okay so I invented a dividend that after 17 years would have made everything have to be delivered. Well, they say, they, their accusation is that, I, you know, I don't know, my, when I'm the CEO of the company, I don't have to worry about short sellers, I worry about the shareholders in the company. They say that it might have had to cause all the stock that was naked short sold and overstock to be delivered. And that would, have, that would have affected the price. And that's where I say back, fellas, you're the ones who say, who've been saying for decades, all of this craziness doesn't affect the price. So why would reversing the crate? <laughs> if I figured a dividend that made that craziness reverse, why would that affect the price? You, you I think it's hilarious. Order. I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> I want to be in court with the SEC and the DOJ on that one. I can't wait. They're I'm they're gonna, investigating. No, I can't wait for that one. They're I'm investigating them now. You know, the, the LA County uh, FBI is investigating short sellers right now and naked short selling. And I know for a fact because uh, Citadel is definitely on that chopping block because the CEO's plane, they've been tracking his plane. His plane hasn't left the tarmac in me weeks since this investigation has started. And the Iron Mountain trucks are, are starting to circle trying to get rid of shit. I bet there's a lot of Iron Mountain. And I know something about that, by the way. So that case that the DOJ has just opened up yeah. is the one that I, 15 years ago, I went and said, this is what the short sellers are doing. That's how they're rigging the system. So I'm very glad they opened it up the SEC or the DOJ a few weeks ago, it's actually based on a whistleblower that I think that the government doesn't know that, know this, but there was a whistleblower. So what happened, and I, I what happens is whistleblowers come to me. I wish they wouldn't, and I'm going to tell all, no whistleblowers come to me ever again, please. And anytime I say something like this, whistleblowers call me up because they're all afraid to go to the government directly, but they think that if they, and it puts me in a horrible position to be told about illegal activity because I don't want to talk to the government ever again in my life. And, and, but now I know about criminal activity. So it puts me in a real dilemma. So no whistleblowers call me. All that said, there was a whistleblower who called me a female uh, about four years ago and started telling me about uh, some stuff going on where she worked. And I spent 18 months trying to coax her into talking to the authorities. Uh, and she, I got a phone call from her about a week ago 
saying, how do you like this case? And she sent me the links to this, uh, this big investigation against these short sellers. <clears throat> And it turns out, and she said, that's me underneath this all. I've actually, I couldn't tell you before, Patrick, but I've been talking to them for two years and I fed them all this. And that's the, the basis on which they have opened this huge case is me. Well, that's a short seller that I kind of work. I mean, not a short seller, a whistleblower that I spent a year or two trying to coax into doing the right thing. So I'm glad to know that this big case you just mentioned actually comes from that, the work of that woman. You know, I realized something. These guys holding this position, maintaining a, a short position, it's costing them hundreds of millions of dollars, right? You figure 20 billion shares, FTDs, that's, you're, you're, you're talking about the hundreds of, bill, hundreds of millions of dollars. They're going to eventually run out of money. They're, I mean, it's a capital requirement, right? That, the collateral, they're gonna, something's going to happen, some kind of catalyst, or they're just eventually going to, because these, these guys from Reddit, they're not leaving, Patrick. They are not selling their shares. They're, this is about principle at this point. I don't think the majority of these, because you know, we, we, there was a discussion, internal discussion among, among this community where how high the stock would go, right? And I, I said, I believe there's enough FTDs out there uh, and, and, and shares uh, that this could potentially reach a million dollars you know, for a short period of time, you know, just the market cap and everything else would be outrageous and, and whatnot. But the one thing that I did hear, right, the one thing that was very fervent in their minds is the floor for them is, is, is seeing Ken Griffin go to jail. That's one. And the fact that they would never sell, uh, you know, in other words, they would never just fold over. They would just hold on to this position until somebody loses their shit. And I think that's brilliant because it costs them hundreds of millions of dollars to maintain the position. And it costs the retail investors zero. And, you know, and you know, the dynamics is a little bit like the, those Chinese landmines and a lot, I think, or you're a Marine. Yeah. I'm sure you know this, that, or the World War II, those mines that you step on and like in old movies, they step on, they don't go off, but it's when you take your foot off. Boxing Betty. About if, if they've got their, if they've got their foot on that stock, and they just and they they're spending the hundred million dollars because if they decide to back out of the position, that thing's going to explode and take their foot off it. That thing's going to explode <laughs> in their face. So their goal is really to never have to take their foot off to just keep it until it's all the way down. So then they do other things to try to destroy the business. We had Goldman call up our suppliers and try to get large suppliers who had like one was owned by Carlisle. Uh, Carlisle brought pressure on them to stop supplying us. Goldman brought pressure on another supplier to stop supplying us because they had some financial. Money. So they do everything they can. So given that they can't lift their foot off the stock they, because that would make it go up and let it go up and explode, their next best alternative is to drive it till it's zero. And not just through the manipulative short selling, but to actually go and screw around with the underlying business. So right. Uh, they'll go to studios and get, the, they'll do things to try to get other businesses to hurt AMC. They'll have their chogi journalists. I'm sure Herb Greenberg and Bethany McLean and, you know, a couple of Roddy Boyd will write stories that the guys running AMC are crooks and just all these stories of. Oh yeah. Yeah. We've seen them. <clears throat> smoke. There's smoke. We don't see any fire yet, but there's clearly a lot of smoke here that really needs to be investigated. And they'll get their DOJ and the SEC to investigate them. They've got the DOJ on speed dial. They got the SEC on speed dial. They can call up and order an investigation. Has AMC had a bunch of federal investigations come at it? Not yet. Uh, what's happening is uh, Adam Aaron's runs a very clean, clean shop. Yes, um, he, he really does. And uh, I don't see how they would be able to, but I, I would assume that they'll probably go through the same grief process um, that you know, if he if he goes with net zero or, or does offer a derivative, uh, uh, like an NFT or something, they're gonna go after him with with such zeal and vigor that, you know, it'll it'll. They should go to T zero. T zero could do it in a couple of weeks. It's all licensed. It's all legal. They should and yeah, but it is funny. Was the SEC gonna say, wait, that's what's so funny that if AMC does that, <clears throat> how many shares do they have outstanding? Five hundred million. Five hundred million is the market cap. Yeah. And well, if they if they go out and they create coins of a new class of stock 
to issue on, on the T0 exchange and they dividend it to all their current shareholders, which would of course expose that there's might be five times as many shareholders as there is actual there's, shares. They're still in debt. That's the other problem. They're still in debt. So I don't think oh, they can okay. issue. Yeah. I think oh, he's got to, I think he's got to clear out the books first. What's hilarious though, that if they get to the point that they can issue that, the SEC will come after them for manipulate based on many, they'll come after them for manipulating their stock. They don't go after the people who have sold 20 billion shares that don't exist for manipulating the stock. But if you do something that would expose the amount of that in the system, that's manipulating the stock. <laughs> Is that, as, yeah. I've been in this for so long, I can't tell what's weird anymore. Do you get that? That's yeah, no, I get it, man. I totally get it. So you were saying if they offer, um, they, if they offer a, 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 a class of coin? Yeah, they go to T0, they create a new class of stock that they issue instead of on NASDAQ or an IC, they issue in the T0 exchange and they dividend it out through their current shareholders. That creates a non-fungible dividend, that, which means that the Ken Griffiths of the world can't, the people who've been naked shorting get exposed by that. And they yeah. have to, May, you know, I guess the theories would make them cover. Maybe there's other, uh, uh, you know, as I say, my job is just to work things out for short sellers. But yeah, it, or, the argument from Cahotes would be that that would show, that that would make the Ken Griffiths have to cover because they can't come up with that non-fungible dividend to deliver themselves. So they would have to close their position. And, but the SEC says, well, that's, that would manipulate the stock if you make all these people close out their naked short position. What you say, well, why does putting it on not change affect any stock price, but making it go away does affect the stock price? How does that work, SEC? <laughs> it's That's so amazing. crooked. It's so crooked. It's cr it's turtles all the way down. Do you know that you're Indian? You told me, did you tell you know that story about Bertrand Russell? He was over in India in the 1920s lecturing on Einstein and a Hindu cosmologist professor stood up in the back of the university hall and said, Russell, that's not how the universe is or organized. It's, it's, it rides on the back of a turtle. Yeah. And Russell, did you know the story? I know, no, but I know the, I know the, the mantra. Yeah. Yeah. And Russell says, well, it, it, uh, <laughs> well, what's the turtle ride on? And the Hindu says, ah, it rides on the back of another turtle. And Russell says, well, what's that turtle ride on? And the Hindu professor says, I'm sorry, Russell, it's turtles all the way down. Well, when I went to DC and I talked to the SEC and FINRA and NICE and NASDAQ and the Senate Banking and the House Financial Services and the Wall Street Financial Press, it's turtles all the way down. It's all corrupt. It's all corrupt. Mm. This is, it's all corrupt. And it, it, the situation persisted for 15 years with Overstock, or no, 13 years we were on this reg show list. We were on it for three years straight. No one's supposed to be on it for more than three days at a time. We were once on it for a thousand days in a row, trading days, four years. Uh, so it's just turtles all the way down. It's all completely corrupt. That's the yeah. lesson I took away. And the actually, it may doom America. You know, our founding fathers understood, Federalist number 10, <clears throat> that what takes down that took down previous attempts at democracy, ancient and modern, was corruption. That is ultimately factionalism and special interests and corruption is what, it, you know, if, you, if you're only, you're, if you have a society that's run by institutions and not men, then you're only as good as your institutions. And, they, and the thing that destroys democracies more than any other is corruption. And yeah. here we are with this open corruption and there's the Chinese Chinese are doing exactly what, you know, they've been doing for a decade, exactly what I was telling the SEC to do since 06, which is to make it so there are no settlement failures. It's not a trading strategy. These guys have trading strategies where they do it 60,000 times in a row, which tells you it's not an accident, no. but it's a trading strategy and they're just allowed to do it. I think Gensler's think got something going on with, uh, with T plus one or T zero, uh, T plus zero. Or whatever that thing is. I know he, there was some talk about. They're it. a T two now. They're a T plus two. They're going to go to T plus one. But the nice thing about blockchain is it's T zero because the trade is the settlement. You know when yeah. you're a little yeah. when you're a little kid and you're buying a baseball card from me and you're trading your you know ice cream cone. Yeah, I get the cone and you get the card at the same time. The trade and the settlement are the same thing. Well, with blockchain. The trade is the settlement. 
There is no separate process that guys like Ken Griffith can manipulate. The trade is a settlement. That's why they hate it. That's why they don't want to see it adopted. It's incredible. Well, Patrick, thank you so much. I am just absolutely grateful uh, to have you on here. I hope you come back. I hope we have another conversation. I want to talk, um, you know, the, hopefully the, the next conversation we have, we can talk about maybe, gov- I don't know if you want to talk government. Um, I'm a government guy. We can talk government and we can talk about, you know, how to fix the system. How do we fix something this saturated in corruption? I hope that can be a topic that we can cover. And, and um, I'm, a, I'm a believer that we should have some difficult conversations uh, and, and, and all the people that are on my, my listeners and on my followers on here, they're a mixed bag. They're liberals, conservatives, uh, libertarians, you name it, they're all there. It's a mixed bag. Um, and, and having these frank conversations, uh, I think, is, is a good thing because it's going to keep people aware and uh, hold, hold Washington accountable. I'd love it. It's about time. I think we're in final days. Rather, it's now or never. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to take right. some Marines. I, you know, the thing I love about the Marines, it used to be the case <clears throat> that you were the guys uh, who understood the Constitution. You know, it's funny. I, I, it used to be the case that the Marines were the only branch that, the only service that swore an oath, not just to the Constitution, but to the president right the president president. well we're called the president's own um because he can send us in times of war without declaring war so lebanon good example 86 uh we we can get sent to any place anytime and uh we can be self-sustained for 90 days yeah 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 well those marine expeditionary forces were some innovation i understand too that that that, yeah Yeah. were you part of any of that i was i was part of a meth and a mu um you know, it, it's something meth? that's really What's beautiful. Meth? What's that? What's a meth? Meth. Marine Expeditionary Forces or a MU Marine, Ex- Marine Expeditionary Unit. Which um, is bigger? I think the meth is the biggest. It's a hierarchy. Okay. Um, when when you're on a U.S. Navy carrier, troop carrier, like, a, like an aircraft carrier, you got 20,000 people on that boat. 20,000. You got aircraft and you got two subs at any time. Uh, in your area, protecting you from, from other subs. And once you start to embark off of those LCACs, those uh, hovercrafts, and you take a beachhead, there is nothing more feeling of, that's just empowering is getting off a truck into a foreign land and you're armed to the teeth and you are the guy carrying the biggest stick. There's something really beautiful about that. It's empowering. It just, it's this, it's primal, man. It's primal. I would imagine, I would imagine that. Mm-hmm. Um, I would imagine that. But the, well, that's an experience few can, few can yeah. experience like you. It is. It's, it's, I had a, I had a wonderful time. I met some incredible folks. I had great leadership examples. I learned the vast majority of my leadership qualities from the Marine Corps, um, how to lead an organization, how to, how to, you know, build employees and not just, you know, order them around. How do you, how do you build a guy up from the ground up to who you want them to be? That's a, that's a skill set the Marine Corps can do better than any organization I've ever seen. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. I I know Marine officers too, just, and more Marines at every level are so well-trained and such good people to work with. I love hiring. I used to hire all the time out of the military. I, I still do. Uh, One of the things I will say is this, um, one Marine officer who went to Harvard Business School took a car, uh, class on leadership. This was back in the 90s. And uh, he came back into the Marine Corps. And I, I run into him and he says, everything that I learned at Harvard Business School was taught in one publication that we have in the Marine Corps called Operations Planning, Resources, uh, uh, Allocations, and, and Executions. And it's all in one big pub. He says, you don't need to go to business school. You just need to master this book, this manual. And you'll, it's, as, it's as if you're... You're getting the equivalency of this. Um, and I thought that was amazing that he made that comparison. A guy who went to Harvard Business School spent all that money. And he says, you don't need to learn this, learn this, because it's the same damn thing <laughs> without the price tag. And I thought, what a masterful thing to say. It was beautiful, you know? So, yeah, um, okay. so hey, let's talk again. I'll, I'll, I'll get with you guys uh, a little later on. And um, let's pick we'll up some stuff. What's that? We'll talk government. We'll talk government, sir. 
Done deal. I, I'm a little bit controversial these days on that subject. I, I have some suspicions the last about the last election that we won't go into here. Oh yeah, I, no, I. Uh, I'm I not sure it's the cleanest election that was ever run. No, I. Uh, I am in the same boat. Uh, very, very murky stuff going on, and uh, it's pretty obvious. I think even even my liberal, deeply liberal friends were like. Ugh, I don't even want to comment on this. You know, that's what they said to me. I was like, yeah, we see it too. We're just not going to comment, which is And funny. I'm not even a Trump guy. I just, I'm, I'm not even, this isn't about Donald Trump to me. This is, I think about a subversion of our country. Yeah. And, oh no. And, yeah. And a soft computer. I'm not even, a, this isn't about Donald Trump to me. It's just everything was, I don't know. I don't want to get, let's, let's save it for next week or whenever we talk. Okay, next. Fair enough. Ha- I'll Patrick, send you a little link to watch before then. You'll I will. It. Perfect. That's a done deal. Patrick, thank you so much for everything. Um, I'll talk to you real soon and uh, we'll go from there. Sound good? Sounds good, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>